Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard here from Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, this is the night sky and with me of course I've got as usual Kay Leather with me as well <laughs> Hello everybody <laughs> Hello Kay and uh, also uh, this other guy, I think his name's Keith Austin <laughs> <laughs> Hello there people, how are you? <laughs> okay folks, well of course it's strange weather, I call it middle of winter and that sort of thing, but we look at the winter stars, but of course the first thing that everybody notices is once it, this, you know, sun goes down, is that big brilliant star that they can see out there mm. in the northwest, and that's not a star at all, of course it's a, the planet Venus, okay? the evening star and of course we only ever see Venus either uh, because it's closer to the Sun than the Earth we only ever see it in the western sky just after sundown or in the morning sky it it's moves. always close to the Sun oh absolutely yes. yeah 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 and of course it is a, I won't go into too much deal but it's a mysterious planet because when you look through the telescope you see virtually nothing <laughs> the surface of the planet is continually shrouded with uh, clouds and of course in the past people used to wonder what's underneath those clouds and in the in the old world when they believed that the sun was actually slowly fading in brightness over billions of years they thought that it was like a a prehistoric world with even with dinosaurs on it but turns out that it's uh, nothing like that at all uh, in fact it's the nearest thing to hell that you can imagine because beneath the clouds um, the yes. atmospheric pressure is enormous, the temperatures are over 500 degrees Celsius and they, it rains sulfuric acid, so <laughs> not a place you'd like to go for holiday. Exactly. Um, I remember Heather Cooper, the British astronomer, pointing out if you visited Venus, you would be simultaneously uh, crushed, boiled and corroded. At the same time, yeah. At, at, the, same, at the same time, so however, it's not a good place to go for your holidays. However, the evidence still is that once upon a time this was a world like the Earth, right? Mm. But then slowly what's happening is the sun is slowly increasing in brightness and over millions of years it changes it. Then you reach a flipping point where suddenly everything goes wild, yeah. Anyway, that's Venus that you can see in the evening sky at the moment. And very shortly it's going to disappear as it moves back down beyond the sun, yeah. It still has the most beautiful look uh, to the naked eye, of course, oh, yeah, yeah. At, uh, at the moment. Just after sundown you can, you can see it there. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, to me it's like a brilliant white jewel. Mm -hmm. And of course to our ancestors, yeah. it, a planet simply means wandering star, and that's exactly what they said, it, what I thought it was, mm. another star, but one of those that moves around. Of course Venus becomes the brightest. Okay, now, turning around to the south, uh, once it gets dark, uh, we see the Southern Cross there uh, laying on its side this time of the year. But what I wanted to look at really is the, the stars looking north. These are the winter stars that we have at the moment. And what we have is the most brilliant region of the Milky Way coming directly overhead on a dark, good dark evening. Once we're away from full moon, folks, that's when you need to have a look at it. Okay? And I've just put, for those watching on TV, I just put a photograph um, in that area showing you the Milky Way that you can capture with a, with a, a camera. And it's absolutely magnificent. It's absolutely crammed with stars. Crown with stars, yeah. nebulae, dark matter and so on and so forth. Uh, but close to where the brightest region is, but in the beyond the dark clouds, is actually the centre of the galaxy. <laughs> so we're looking towards galactic centre, but we can't see it because of those that black region you can see is actually dark clouds, which are simply blotting out the light of more distant stars. Yeah. But the distance, as I've put it up there, is just under 27,000 light years. However, it's, um, the clouds block uh, the visible light, but you can see um, to the centre of the Milky Way galaxy in infrared and also in radio. Uh, in right. fact, the, um, the very early days of radio astronomy, one of the first things that was detected was this very loud perpetual hiss coming from the centre of the galaxy. Yes. That's right, Sagittarius yeah. A. That's right. Yeah, they call it, yeah. Yeah. And of course we now know that is in fact a titanic black hole sitting there, all right? And uh, in fact it's the biggest black hole in the galaxy. And indeed what we've actually discovered is at the centre of every big galaxy 
there's a titanic black hole, something you would not want to get close to. Mm. Would you like to play us a tune to the black hole? <laughs> <laughs> well, seeing as how a black hole absorbs all radiation, if I were to play a, uh, play a piece of music to uh, acknowledge a black hole, it would sound like silence. <laughs> Um, because all the all the sound energy would be absorbed because that's what a black hole does. Yeah. It just yeah. it's literally a cosmic vacuum cleaner. It sucks everything into itself. That's right. Yeah. And uh, this is why they're so incredibly dangerous to uh, to space travellers. Mm. Yeah. But um, and of course, people keep always trying to theorise what's actually down there. You know. Yes. But what space and time, everything gets distorted. Be so. Time you see here moves at a rate once you get near a black hole time begins to slow down yes right? and the closer you get to yeah. the singularity yeah the so for example if, if, goes, if, if yes. keith were to jump down a black hole and i was standing outside right i he would appear to leap towards the black hole and he would slow down and then he would, after a while he'd stop as if like a fly in a blotting paper stopped there yes. but for keith the experience would be entirely different he would go straight down into the hole and at the same time i would see the universe speeding up yes that's right yeah. yes yeah yes. weird and wonderful. maybe we should spend some time talking about a black hole in a future program exactly and yes. exactly what they're all yeah. about because it's a place where all the things that we're used to space and time that which we think have just fixed things actually all begin to change yeah so that's that's the great black hole that's there well looking just above that region in the uh, milky way there uh, we have the scorpion uh, which is my favorite constellation it looks like a great hook in the sky you can see it up there yes. uh, for those watching there's the scorpion okay it's one constellation that looks like its name <laughs> yes, yes that's all right yeah let's bring it up a little bit closer and uh, the first thing you'll notice is the uh, bright star antares that's uh, the brightest star in the scorpion it's one of the brightest stars in the sky but what is very noticeable with antares when you look at it is its color it's got this definite yellowy orange color yeah. and as i've mentioned it probably several times before that stars have colors depending upon their temperature but the human eye, its ability to detect colours drops away as things get fainter and fainter. Right? We use what we call, we've got two cells in our eyes, the rods and the cones. Mm. And the rods give us black and white vision, but they're very, very sensitive. So at night, when you're, there's not much light, you're using the rod cells. The cones give you the colour vision. Well, when we look at a star, most of the time, there's not enough energy coming to us to trigger those cone the cells so we see it as a white star and cone cells in the retina but yes, when you look yeah. through a telescope suddenly you realize they're all different colors mm. and of course these colors are based upon the temperature our sun's a yellow star yes stars hotter than our sun are, are white or blue yep S stars cooler are orange or red and you can see antares even with the unaided eye there's just enough light there to begin to trigger yes. it through a so very... Antares is a uh, red supergiant, is that right? Uh, Absolutely, I've, yes. I've brought up a little image here. Look, first of all, we've uh, go to that. For those of you looking, uh, embedded in the, in the Milky Way, particularly towards galactic centre where we're looking now, is all these clouds of dust and gas. And when mm. you get a big bright star, the gas reflects the light of the brighter stars. And here we can see a photograph of Antares. For those of you looking at it, you can see the definite colour of it. But also, the light of Antares is being reflected by surrounding cosmic clouds. And the distance to Antares, incidentally, is 605 light years. Now, this is telling you something. That this is an enormous distance away. And the very fact that it was one of the brightest stars in the sky tells you that this is a pretty yes. luminous star so let's go and have a look now for those of you watching this on tv what i've just brought up is a picture looking out if you were standing on pluto right right <laughs> in the outer regions of our galaxy and you're looking back at the sun that big bright object there the star there is our sun and that's all the sun would look like from pluto is a big bright star mm. a bit like venus we were looking in the sky earlier on Okay, now imagine a, a planet a similar distance uh, from Antares, and we'll bring that up. There you are. You can see it's a yes. pretty big star. Yes. Okay. It shows you how much bigger and hotter yeah. now, um, than our sun. Yes. It's 
but roughly 76,000 times brighter than the, the sun. But most of that light is in the infrared and red radiation. About 10, about, it's about, if you just look, measured it on the brightness of visible light, which we see, it's 10,000 times brighter, but the total energy output from it is 76,000 yes, yes. times, okay? And its diameter, as I put up there, is 883 times that of, the, of our sun, right? Yes. So it's a pretty big star, but it's a red star, okay? And not so long ago, uh, Antares was a, a blue-white star. And then as it's aged, it turns into this red supergiant, which it's doing at the moment. Yes. Okay. It's because it's, um, it's gone through most of its hydrogen fuel. Because it's a massive star. It, you yes. see, the bigger a star, the more rapid it, its life is. Yes. Now, what's quite obvious also when you look at um, Antares for a telescope particularly, it's got a companion star, which has a distinctive greenish colour when you look at it for a telescope. It's actually a blue-white star, but I think it's the colour of Antares which is accentuating the By greens. comparison, yeah. yes, it, yeah. it gives it a greenish look. It's yes. our eyes, in other words. Yeah, yeah. it is, yeah. yeah. Mm. And Antares, the, what we call, has a special name called Antares B, OK? And How it, very romantic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And it, it orbits around the, the big star in a period of 574, uh, sorry, in a period of 878 years. Mm. <coughs> but it's no faint star. It's actually nearly 3,000 times brighter than the sun. <coughs> and of course, if it wasn't for Antares, they would see it quite easily with an unaided eye. It's just that we can just tend to yes. get lost in it. Yeah. So the si size of the main component, Antares A, <coughs> just overwhelms the um, uh, the, uh, the visual from Antares B. <coughs> yeah. yeah, and of course the other thing with Antares, as I say, is it has this huge size. Um, for those of you looking at uh, uh, this on TV, there's an image that has been created showing you what uh, Antares would look like from uh, somewhere in the vicinity of Jupiter. Uh, that sort of distance from mm. uh, because on the earth uh, you'd actually be inside it it's you'd be inside big. the star yeah. yes yes yeah and it's also variable it gradually fluctuates in brightness over a, a period of time right mm. but all those giants do that yeah as they run out of one fuel they they kind of diminish they a bit become unstable. then they fire up a new fuel and get going again yeah. Yes, they start running on helium yeah. instead of hydrogen. Yes. Yeah. Well, they go through a whole range of them, don't they? There's about six different elements they seem to run through. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that, they're the common elements in the universe, right? Mm. If you, like you took a, uh, They eventually run out. Yeah. They've only got lead or something. Yeah, Iron. that's right. Yes. Iron, but, yeah. But there are lots yeah. of rare elements in the universe, like gold and platinum. And they're only produced when a star, a giant star dies in a, a supernova explosion. So you're looking at the source of your gold ring. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, it will be eventually. And, when yes. it, and it, it almost certainly when this star dies, exactly, it will yes. go up with a big bang yes. as well. Yeah. Yes. Now, I've first put up there, the age of it is 11 million years old. Now, compared to um, me, that's probably fairly old. You know, <laughs> but for stars go, it's, it's, it's a baby star, you know. Yes. Yeah. When you consider the sun is uh, over four billion years old. That's right. Yeah. And, it's, and it's still only middle aged. Yeah. It's, uh, I compare, I look at stars like, rather like car engines. If you've got a little mini, you know, mini um, car engine, it goes through its fuel very slowly. But if you've got a, a V12 or a V8 or something like that, a big engine, it goes through its fuel so much faster. And this is why the big stars die young, mm. because mm. they run out of fuel uh, really, so much, really so much quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned this before. For example, if, if you doubled the mass of the sun, it wouldn't be tw twice as bright. It would be 16 times brighter. Yes. Yeah, so there's something like the fourth power. Right? Is that because yeah. of the square law? Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So that, that's that's it. So big bright stars look wonderful in the night sky, but mm. they've all got short, short life expectancies. Now, it's common star in the galaxy, of course, are red dwarfs, but they're all so faint that yes. not one can be seen with the unaided eye. Yeah, those are the equivalent of a mini 
That's right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah such a tiny little star, and it yeah. just sips its way through its fuel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, Antar uh, Antares is a double star, okay, uh, as I say, it's, and it's a magnificent object. Have a, have, go out and have a look for it f in the night sky. You, c you can't miss the scorpion up there, okay? Now, at the other end of the scorpion, there's the tail, is Shula. A Shula is the sting of the scorpion. Right. Mm -hmm. And immediately when you look at it, you can see it's n certainly not a red star like Antares. Right? Well, Shula uh, is not associated with Antares at all. Uh, I've just pulled up its distance. It's 365 light years. So about half the distance uh, of Antares. A lot closer, yeah. yes. Yeah. And of course, wherever we, when we look out at night sky and we see these different constellations, it's... What we're seeing is the perspective from our spot on the Earth. If you were to travel to another star, the patterns would all begin to change. They'd all shift, yes. Yeah, yeah. that's right, yeah. There's Shula. So that Shula is a, a blue giant star, right? And it's over 36,000 times brighter than the sun. It, too, is slightly variable. And it has these little pulsations and so on. So... Mm. It may well be a star that's just on the edge of its end of its natural life and it's about to turn into a red supergiant like uh, Antares. Yes, yes. So if you come back in a few millions of years' time, you might discover there's another big red star there in the tail of the scorpion. In the tail of the scorpion, yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so that's another nice important star there. Okay, now, but in fact, the interesting thing about Shula is not one star. It's actually a triple star system. Mm. Now, you can't see these things with a telescope eye, right? but it's got other smaller stars, which it's in orbit around it, right? Uh, one orbits around it in a period of six days, another one in 1,053 days. Right? Six, six days? Yeah. So that's very close to the, uh, uh, to yes, the primary, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And both of these are smaller stars similar to our sun, which are orbiting around it, yeah. I think the one that's close is liable to be eliminated when that one goes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or, or something will happen, yeah, that's yeah. for certain, yeah. I mean, it'd be part of the whole explosion. Well, the explosion, but what you'll, what you'll get is, uh, yeah, it, it will sort of link up in some ways. We still don't know all the details of what happens in, in binary systems. Mm. Some um, of them do join together, mm. and then they, mm. um, they can have an effect on the yeah. age of the, yeah. how long the, the stars are going to last. Well, oh, right. often when we're looking at a binary system, we find a star, which first of all appears to be um, a single star, and then we discover there's a neutron star or something orbiting around it. <laughs> well, the very fact there's a neutron star tells you that's the corpse of a bigger star that was there yes. billions of years ago. Yeah. But in this case, you've got a big star with a little star going around it. Yeah. So a little star is liable to suffer a kind of planetary fate, isn't it? But the other, the other thing that could happen is as, as, as Antares expands, it will, the matter that's growing outwards will get ac accumulated, you know? Which will increase the mass of the original star. That's right, And yeah. therefore speed some things up. Yeah, that's mm. right, yeah. All right, so that's Shula there, okay? Now, if you look at the, in the sky, you discover that uh, it, Shula appears to have another star next to it, which is like always seen as the spike on the, the tip of the tail of the scorpion, okay? Mm. But I'm afraid the other star has got nothing to do with Shula whatsoever. Uh, that's called Lesath. And its distance is 520 light years, so it's further away, almost as far away as Antares is. All right? So, as I say, when we're looking at these patterns up there, we're just seeing things as we hmm. see them from hmm. this perspective on Earth. Yeah, we see we see the stars as, as though they're printed on the yeah. inside of a yeah. uh, big black dome, yeah. and they all seem to be the same distance. They are not. Hmm. Yeah, they're so. Depending on the mass of a star, when it starts off, its colour varies from faint red stars. And then as you add the mass in, it gets hotter and hotter. So it goes from there to yellow, to orange, to yellow, white. And then you get the blue-white stars, which are the most massive, right? Mm. But then uh, later in their life, 
they begin to evolve internally and they turn into gigantic red stars and then explode and so on and so forth you know yeah or in the case of a smaller star it doesn't explode it just puffs its outer layers off and yes. it creates what we call a planetary, a planetary nebula. nebula and we'll yes, have to yes, show you yes. we'll show you some of these later all right yeah. so just like all the animals on our planet which are evolving and changing and change through time so the stars are doing the same things because the, but the, for me the fascinating thing is that when we're looking out there all those stars every one of them is in some respect a distant sun they might vary in brightness and so on but they're all distant suns and orbiting around them are planets mm -hmm. so just think of how many worlds <coughs> there are out there okay <coughs> Okay, well, having said all of that, I'd just like to mention that if you'd like to find your way, you're not sure how to find your way around the heavens, uh, we run Star Trek, don't we, Kay? At, uh, Stonehenge. Yeah, we do. And the interesting thing about these private tours is the more people you have, the cheaper per person. So um, we have to cover our costs and, and Richard's time if there's only one or two and get a minimum charge but for goodness sake if you can kind of ring in a few extra people you're going to make it a lot cheaper for yourselves mm. Mm. and with the star trek what we do is we start off with a little presentation about the night sky and our place in the universe then after that we take people out beneath the stars and we pick out the bright stars the planets the constellations and so on all right <laughs> so it's all about finding your way around the heavens and believe you me folks once you've done this a few times you will be able to recognize the different stars and of course yes. what stars you're going to see will depend upon the seasons they're changing all the time and the time of night of course that's right so, yeah. yes yeah. and the handy thing with um using what we call naked eye rather than a telescope is that you can look and find your way around the stars in conditions that you would not use a telescope in yeah. because the atmosphere is too unstable you can't see that with well, your eyes this is but if you magnified it you'd have stars twinkling and carrying on and doing all sorts of strange things and also that there's clouds and with an experienced astronomer like richard they can find their way around in the gaps yeah yeah well i mean that's the first thing you do if you be, if you're interested in the stars you're interested in astronomy long before you ever look for a telescope you actually <laughs> need to be able to find your way around the heavens otherwise identify, you don't know where to point do you <laughs> uh, yeah identify the bright stars and so yes. you can then also then once you've done that you can identify what's up what's planets well, to we me, mentioned the, venus early but yes. also mars is in the sky in the early morning you've got jupiter in the sky yes. uh, yeah what to else me, does the, a um, star trek have richard i mean you actually show an audio visuals and and we we usually go down to the hinge at some stage yeah yeah so you might want to talk about some yeah. of the other things that are part of the program oh well we we do it from the center of the hinge and in that we also use the hinge stones first of all to, so people can orientate themselves the always the first thing i do is show people how to orientate themselves in the sky how mm. to find absolute due south and all those sorts of things we do that with the stones but then we do it with the stars because the stones are based on what the stars are doing in the first place yeah yes yeah to me the uh, the bright stars are like uh, familiar friends you yeah. know that's because every every time when we have a clear night and i'm looking up and um um oh yeah there's the there's the southern cross and there's and there's scorpio yeah and uh, there's sagittarius right right in, plumb in the middle of the nucleus of the galaxy yeah. and all that sort of thing you know they, these these are um um patterns and mm. stars as familiar to me as the back of your hand is yeah. to you so listen folks yes. if you want to know about yes. a star trek the thing is just to phone up stonehenge and speak to Kay, and she'll explain what's or all about if you follow the um, email address that's on the web page yeah. now mm. stonehenge is open at the moment we're winter hours we're open on the weekends from 10 to 4 plus any holidays all right and uh private tours at any time at by anything. arrangement Same so you can do a um, a daytime tour of stonehenge atro with richard you can do a tour that ends at sunset or you can do the star trek mm -hmm. the sunset one obviously ends at sunset but the <laughs> um the dark the yeah. star trek will begin yeah. about an hour after yeah. sunset yeah. and look, look folks to see the hedge properly it needs to be in the daylight hours all right 
because it, people say, oh, we'll have to sit underneath the stars. Well, you can, but uh, you, you, kind you, of you can't see the structure properly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Not without torches, which and kind of course, spoils. We have special events at Stonehenge, and coming up, of course, the next, which you're all looking forward to, is the spring equinox. And that's going to start at five o'clock on Saturday, September the 23rd, which is the actual day of the spring equinox. And we're also going to be having live music out there as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, which uh, I shall be providing. Uh, myself and some friends will be providing live music out at Stonehenge. So it's going to be a mixture of astronomy and music. That's right. And yeah, and of course, it, you'll learn all about what the spring equinox was originally about thousands of years ago and so on. Yeah. And you'll experience some of the acoustics down there. They're really quite amazing. Absolutely. Some yeah. of the people who come out, I encourage them to have some fun with the acoustics. <laughs> and they always come back with great big grins on their faces. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll show you all that when you come out. Anyway, it's talking about that. We'd better get Keith to play us a tune or two, yeah? Yes. Well, I brought my flute with me again. Um, it's uh, a little bit cold, actually, because it's been outside. But, uh, and uh, to be honest, I'm still learning how to play. You know, I've, only, I've only had this a few months, and uh, it takes a while to learn to play a musical instrument. It would... That okay. <laughs> reminds me of the scorpion, yeah. this massive big scorpion in the sky, that's this hot constellation, as it were, yeah. with this burning hot star at its heart. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll, have to t we'll have to talk about the sto stories behind the scorpion yes. at, our, at our next one. Anyway, yeah, the it's scorpion really time, and Orion. Yes, yes. it's time yes. to wind off now. But do look, folks, do go outside, have a look. Uh, to see that Milky Way in all its majesty, you need to be away from town and city lights. All right? uh, but you're, if you go out there, you'll, you'll look up at the brightest region. You're bound to be able to pick out the, the shape of the scorpion up there. Yes. Okay. Right, okay, folks, so we'll catch you up in the near future. There we go. Okay. Yes. Bye, everybody. <laughs> okay, then, folks. Okay. Catch you later. Bye. <laughs>